time. Look what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. was born a Savior. Lord, you've forgiven our sins when we confess them to you. You make the slate clean. You take away the old and you put in the new. And Lord, you do all things well. Lord, I thank you for the grace of God, the goodness of the great I am. I pray today, Lord, that in this service, Lord, you'd be magnified and exalted and lifted up on high. For you said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And that's our desire is to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted up. Hallelujah. So, Father, today have your will. Touch those that need a physical touch in their bodies. I thank you. You're not only our Savior, you're our healer. I thank you, Lord, that with your stripes we're made whole. And, Father, from the common cold to cancer, you can cure it all. There's no disease, affliction, or infirmity that you can't handle. And, Lord, you died for all of them. So, Lord, today I pray for healing to happen in the house of God. Lord, I lift up Pastor Brendan as he ministers the word at Catlin today. God, we pray for that church as they are getting ready to search for a new leader. I pray, God, you'd give them, Lord, wisdom and, Lord, just anointing in the house. God, bless today and minister here at Central. God, may you be honored above all else. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Somebody shout it. Before you sit down, greet somebody. Give them a handshake, a heads up. Amen. Praise God. We want to welcome you to Central Assembly of God. It's a beautiful morning. I know others are making their way in. And uh, we got a a lot going on this morning. It's going to be a full day. Thank God you're here. Amen. And for those that are coming, Lord, keep them safe as they come. Hallelujah. A couple of announcements. Don't forget tomorrow night is Royal Riders, 630. Amen. It's a meeting tomorrow, not a ride. So be here at 630 with a Bible study and great time together so that mark that down and then uh, we have a few things coming up I'm going to invite Victoria and Ken to come on up for a minute and they got something to share on their hearts amen I'm going to, I'm going to borrow your microphone just good morning brothers and sisters Um, Last night we had an event up at the mall, um, the Set the Sky to Music. We want to thank everyone that came out and helped. Um, We raised $327 for Tammy Twitchell. Um, I'd like to give a little blurb. (laughs) A little blurb about what we do August 6th. We do this benefit the first Saturday of August every year. This is our fourth annual. And Tammy Twitchell is a foundation that helps 
families that have a member in the family that suffer, suffers cystic fibrosis, and it's usually children. So they help with all kinds of finances, medical expenses, hotel stays, ga gas cards, groceries, and around Thanksgiving and Christmas, they help provide food and gifts for families that have members that suffer with cystic fibrosis. And um, we do an auction at our benefit. Um, and I'd like to encourage um, you to think about putting together either a gift basket, if you have a craft um, that you might like to sell uh, or donate that can raise money to continue our efforts to help benefit um, Tammy Twitchell Craft Foundation, it would be greatly appreciated. So if you would contact myself or Kenny, did I miss anything? <laughs> so thank you for your time and attention. And at the mall, at the mall last night, uh, we we're set in the right place last night. Uh, on one side we had a tarot card reader, and on the other side we had a beer tent. And the Lord brought everyone. Our line was the longest line for the face painting and the the water. And the beer's not going to quench anyone's thirst. The the water from Jesus will quench their thirst. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. We were able to pass out a number of invitations to our VBS and uh, also to the Tammy Twitchell ride. A couple more announcements. By the way, Jennifer, God used Jennifer last night to minister to the uh, lady who was doing the tarot cards. She began to weep and cry and said, I don't need, I shouldn't be doing this. And God just, used, it was just powerful. Amen. God gave Jennifer a specific word for her about her life, and it hit to the T, and it kind of touched her, and thank God. Amen. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. Don't forget the 23rd of July is our Royce Mitchell Invitational Golf Tournament for Speed the Light. And if you're a golfer, sign up for that. Get involved. See Ed Seacrest. Amen. And uh, is it the ninth, Dave? Is there a fishing derby? Graduation. All right, so we do have a fishing derby coming up. I'll get you the date soon. And it's in August when we would have our normal meeting. So I think that would probably be the 13th. August 13th be the men's fishing derby. So mark that down, amen. And then on August 6th is the ride, Tammy Twitchell ride. Mark that down. There's a lot going on. Just keep your calendars. When you get a calendar, hold on it for the month and make sure you know what's going on. We are an active church, and uh, we keep very busy. We had uh, people out for worship Friday night, and normally this, fr this Sunday would be worship tonight, but we had it Friday night out to Park Station instead. Had a good turnout, had a great night of worship. It, and we thank you all who came and those who have participated in bringing dish to pass and stuff. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. How many came to worship the Lord? Let's stand on our feet and let's give him glory in the house.
enough words there's not enough words to say God to thank you for your love and for your goodness God it doesn't sound like enough but we just want to say thank you we just want to thank you we just want to thank you for your love that never ends and your mercies that are new every day even when we don't deserve them God we thank you that sounds so trite but God we just want to say thank you over the mountains and the seas your river runs with love for me and I will open
sacrifice. We have something, something so precious that the world needs. And when they find what we have, when we share with them what we have, they're going to be filled with the joy and the excitement that we have. The world is so, so, so in need. And I just can't get enough of this branch because when they know, when they know, Father, greater love hath no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. But God took it a step further and commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Father, I thank you for the love of God. I thank you. Paul said, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. It's the love Christ had for me that motivates me to do what I do for him. And Lord, today I thank you for the love of God that's been manifested in our lives and given to us freely without charge and without cost on our part, but a great cost on your side. Lord, you were willing to sacrifice everything you are to purchase us back to yourself when Adam sold us out to sin. God, I thank you that today that love is still available and evidenced in our lives. And God, I thank you, Lord, that the world can't give what you've given. The world can't take away what you've given. And Lord, your love is from everlasting to everlasting. Who shall separate us from the love of God? The Bible's clear. There's nothing that can separate us from God's love. Lord, I thank you for that this morning. So, Lord, in this service, let the love of God flow freely. Let the Spirit of God fall heavily. Let the Word of God come forth fluently. And, Lord, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated this morning. Today I have the privilege of dedicating three children to the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to invite Zach and Katie and the family to come and stand right over here on my right, your left, and Brad, Bianca, and the the family to come and stand right here on my left. Amen. I love dedicating children. The Bible tells us that they brought young children unto him, that is to Jesus, that he should touch them. How many know that our kids need the touch of God on their life today? They don't need to be brought up in the way of the world. They need to be brought up in the way of the cross. His disciples rebuked those that brought them, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. He said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and he blessed them. We find baby dedication, infant dedication in the life of Hannah and and Elkanah, her husband. Hannah was not able to have children, and she prayed to God and said, If you give me a son, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. And God honored that prayer, and God blessed him with Samuel. And she nursed him and weaned him, and when the time came, she brought him back to the temple and presented him to the Lord and gave him back to the Lord to be raised in the nurture and admonition of God. That's what we do here. We dedicate children. We don't baptize them. We don't sprinkle them because they're not old enough to make that decision. And baptism is a sign that you've accepted Christ and you've made the decision. But what infant dedication is, it's more for the parent to say to God, I will raise my child in the ways of God. And there's a lot of responsibility that falls on mom and dad at this time. And we give the children back to the Lord, but we also say we're going to raise them for God. And that's what we do here. And so we're going to take, and can I take the little one first here? I'm going to start right here with little Emily. She's a little sweetie. Now she's going to be good. She's going to look at everybody out there because she don't want to look at pastor. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for little Emily. What a sweet little life. And you said children are an heritage of the Lord. They're a blessing from God. And Father, it's a privilege, but it's a responsibility that, Lord, we raise them to serve Jesus. Lord, we're living in difficult days, but I present this child to you. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would have your way should you tarry in this life You said that we have a purpose, and Lord, each child is created for a reason that you alone know. And Lord, we just allow you to have your way in the life of this little one. And God, I pray your blessing upon her and upon the family. In Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, I dedicate little Emily Green to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. She's a good little girl. She didn't spoil my record. I've been fortunate that I haven't had any of them cry on me yet. Are you going to come to me, Bria? Yeah. Bria's the older sister, but it says he brought the young children, not just the infants. Amen. How many know that God has a plan for all of us? And he said to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. God's got a, a purpose for Bria. He's got a plan for her life. And we're going to ask God that he'd have his way in her life as we did with Emily. Father, we present Bria to you, Lord, right now. We give her to you all the days of her life, should you tarry. God, I thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God that will rest upon her. I pray, God, that you would use her for your glory. I pray she would be 
a blessing to mom and dad and to all that she comes in contact with. And should you tarry and should she live a long life, I pray, God, that she would have fruit for the kingdom that remains. We present Bria to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I pray, God, that you would use her for your glory, keep her, protect her, preserve her. And, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. I now dedicate Bria Barnes to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on back here. Good girl. She did well. Let's see if we can get away with it again. How you doing, little miss? Ah, uh, Brin Brinley. We got Brinley now. Amen. Isn't she a cutie just like Emily? I love the little infants. Amen. Lord, right now, one more time, we present Brinley to Jesus. God, Lord, only you know the footprints that she'll walk in and, cre and create in her life. But I pray they would be the footprints of Jesus as she follows in your steps. God, I pray, Lord, that you would put the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon her little life. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And Lord, I pray the anointing would rest on these children and upon Brinley right now. And I pray, God, that your anointing would be powerful and precious. I pray, Lord, you'd use her for the kingdom's sake. And Lord, I pray you'd put a hedge of protection around her, keep her from sickness, disease, affliction, infirmity. And Lord, just guide her every step. I present Brinley to you right now, Lord, and dedicate her to the Lord. And we ask that she'd be a blessing to her family and everyone she comes in contact with in life as she grows into young womanhood and then into adulthood. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Or you can smile. You're a cutie. Huh? Here we go, Dad. 100% unreal. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. Isn't this precious? And you know what? I want to pray one more prayer. I want to pray for mom and dad. Amen. Because they have a, a huge responsibility. This life is in your hands. This child is going to be guided and guarded by you. Hannah said, I'll take care of him until I bring him back. I'll do the responsibility of doing my part. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for Zach and Katie, for Brad and Bianca. I pray, Lord, for the extended family. God, I pray for brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the grace they need to nurture and to raise these children according to the precepts of God's word. And, Lord, I pray, God, that they would find, Lord, a blessing in raising these children. And, Lord, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. Precious, amen. And now we're going to move on, not to the little children, but I'm going to have Ed and Dawn come because kids don't stay kids, do they? And today we've got uh, a few, I think. I don't know how many. Let me find the uh, microphone. Is it over here? I'll give Ed, Ed and uh, Dawn the mic. We have some graduate, graduates. Graduates, are they here? I hope so. I'll ask Kayla Bowers. Je Bower, yeah. There's more than one of them. He's got more than one personality. <laughs> Caleb, come on up. Jeff Stewart, come on up. Nate, Nate Ayosa, come on up. We also have a fourth, Taylor Shaw, but he had to work this morning, and you couldn't get out of it. These, these are our young men that are, that are 
going to go on and be the future of our church. Now, uh, I do have things to say, but hold on a second. Yes, that would be a good thing. We love our young people. These are some wonderful young men, and uh, I would encourage you uh, to get to know them. Uh, they are just really awesome, and we are privileged to, to know them and uh, the, the things that God has for them in the future. So, Eddie, you have to come. Yes. Now, for those of you who don't know, Caleb is a graduate of Thomas A. Edison High School. He, he ran track th this past season. He did so well in the high hurdles, they made him a champion. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, he, uh, he graduated from the Corning Painter Post School District. And I believe both are going on to Corning Community College, and, uh, which is good. Caleb will be doing conservation, and Jeff, you're doing arts, which is really good because they're needed in the church. Nate is a graduate of Corning Community College, which is, which is why we are honoring him. Because it's... 80% of all young people that graduate from high school leave the church. Nate has not left the church. So I, I just want Nate to commend you for that especially. But uh, we have some gifts for you, but gifts first? Or, yeah, well, how about you? The word first, okay. There's, there's a, a verse that is, is spoken of Many times people use it when, when they talk to uh, young people, especially, I believe. But over in the youth sanctuary, we, we have, a, like Pastor Joe has, focus on forever. We have our own uh, over, over there. And uh, it starts out with Jeremiah. It's called the journey. Because we believe every young person is on a journey because... Nobody, when you're, when you're in high school, knows what your future is really going to hold. You have plans, you have ambitions, but so often people major in something and never do it again. But there's a journey within the, the church setting, within the Christian life, that needs to be fulfilled in every young person. And our journey over there, it starts with Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. If you're wondering why I'm reading off the paper, I can make it real big so I can read it. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And a lot of people stop right there. But it goes on in verse 13. It says, You will seek me and find me, when you seek me with all your heart. So, so young men, we are encouraging you to remain faithful in church and remain faithful in following God because even being brought up in a church is not enough because I know, Caleb, you, you've gone on mission trips and, and you've got a heart for El Salvador. That heart needs to be transferred out into the congregation. Because when they see young people going after missions, don't want that. And Jeff, you're going into the arts. The arts are missing from the church as a whole. We need young people like yourself to embrace the arts and, and bring it back into the church and give us that, that energy that we need here to really reach people. And Nate, your faithfulness. Nate comes in Wednesday night after Wednesday night. He runs our sound for us. And he's been doing this since he graduated out of youth group. He's, he's come in and it's such a valuable asset to the church, faithfulness. Because when young people see you going on and following after God, they know they can do that. So it's very possible. I want to talk to you about a man named Isaiah. 
Now, from what I've read, Isaiah was a young man. He was a prophet. He's the first prophet we read about in the Bible. He comes, you know, you have Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastics, and then Isaiah. And Isaiah was a young man who came from, what they say, a, a very well-to-do family. And Isaiah was sent by God to all Israel. So God was using Isaiah all the time coming up. And it wasn't because he is wealthy, and it wasn't because he was from a well-to-do family. I want to read you from Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 8. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim. Each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorsteps and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has taken away your sin and atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. What I, what I want to point out in all this, Isaiah knew who God was. Isaiah was commissioned to go and be a prophet for the Lord. Isaiah foretold of, of the birth of Christ. Isaiah was used powerfully. But Isaiah had an encounter with God. He had a mighty encounter with God. To such a point, he felt like he was the worst person on earth. And he said, woe is me. He was... He felt God's righteousness in such a way, he actually thought he was going to die till the angel came and put the coal to his lips. The point I want to make is, for you to be used the way God wants you to be used, you need to be found in this house. You need to be found in the presence of God. It's because when you enter in to the very presence of God, and you, it's like you're seeing him face to face because you can enter into the holy of holies now. That's when your life is truly changed. And that's when God will say, who will I send? And you'll say, here I am, send me. And, and it's something that many of us have gone through, many still have to go through. That part where you have the encounter with God in such a way that you'll say, here am I, send me. So with that, we have some gifts, and then we want to pray over you. And uh, one person I didn't, Taylor, if you're watching online, we, we do have this for you, Lord, because I know you're working. But Taylor, Taylor Shaw is one kid who, when people come into the youth group, he makes them feel welcome. It doesn't matter who it is, where they're from. Taylor automatically goes to them and they're drawn to Taylor. And how many know we need people like that within our church? We need to be the kind of people when people come, we go to them and they look at and they feel drawn to us. So Taylor, I commend you for that. And this message is for you, Taylor, that you need not to work all the time on the weekends. Be found in the house of God. No, I'm serious. It's easy to get caught up working in a job 
and say, I can't make it to church. But when you can, you have to be here because this is where you will encounter God. At this altar is where your life will get changed. So it's not just for the young people. It's for everybody out here. Don't ever neglect the house of the Lord. So, Don, if you'd like to present the gifts. Okay. Uh, let's see. Make sure that I give the right thing. Nate, we love you so much. We thank you for your service to the youth group. And uh, I know you're working, uh, and some of those Wednesdays you're not able to make it, but we thank you for when you can. And so God bless you. Um, we love you. Uh, and Jeff, I met you at a pet store. And we had the best conversations in the stores and then in Walmart. And I love this kid. He, he is just, um, I could talk to him all day. Um, I love it. And, uh, and so God bless you. And I'm so thankful that you're here. And God's going to use you in mighty, mighty ways. And so we, we love you. And here is Caleb. We love this young man. He's gone on mission trips. He said yes. He's helped to build homes for people. Um, and uh, so we so appreciate it. And as God leads you, I'm so glad you didn't go into the uh, U.S. Army. I'm glad you're in God's Army. And, uh, and as he leads you and directs your path, uh, maybe next year we'll be able to go. I will be able to go to El Salvador with you. I'm looking, uh, as God's speaking to me, to go. And so maybe we'll get to go together. And so God bless you, young men. We want to pray for you. And uh, Taylor, uh, we have a gift for you, too. We'll present it to him on Wednesday. Um, so we love that young man, too. And so, uh, Eddie, we're going to, or are you going to have Pastor pray? Okay. Lord, I just thank you so much, Lord God, for the privilege of ministering to these young men. I thank you, Father, for your hand upon them. I thank you, Lord, that you, Lord God, love them more than even their parents love them. Lord God, you had, a, 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 you commissioned them from the time they were born. Father, for even before you knew them, before they were even in their mother's womb. And so, Lord God, we thank you and we praise you. And we thank you, Father, Lord God, as we uh, uh, just hand them back over to you, uh, Lord God, on their next journey with you, that they will continue forward with you. And, Lord God, they will let you lead. And, Father, they, they will follow you all the days of their life. And, Father, everything that they do, Lord God, would be bring glory to your name. We thank you and praise you. In your name, amen. 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 And, and fellas, one more thing before you leave. Dave, could you stand up? This is Dave Petroni. He has a ministry for you to step into now because you're no longer kids. Now you're adults and you're young men. And Amen. that's our men's ministry. He has a Bible study. He will minister you. He will guide you. He will direct you in any way you need. So make sure you talk to Dave before you leave today. Amen. Thank you, Ed. Amen. We love you guys. Yeah, last week he took them, so he's trying to take them again. God is good, isn't he? This is not only the future of the church, this is the present of the church. How many know that young people are not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today? And there are, we heard the statistic that there are a number of young people that when they hit the age of 18, they graduate, they leave the church. It's a large number, but you know, the church needs the young per person, amen? But the young person needs the church. You can't make it without the Lord in your life. And some people say to me, well, preacher, I don't have to go to church to be saved. 
You don't have to go to church to get saved, but you need to be there if you're going to stay saved. And I want to tell you something. You don't just need to go to any church. You need to go to a church that preaches the Word of God. See, we're living in a day where a lot of churches don't practice or preach the Word of God. That's going to church makes you a Christian as much as living in a garage makes you an automobile. The Bible said they'll have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. You don't just need to go to any church. How many know you need to go to the church where you're going to be fed and led and grow in God? And I'm going to begin a five-week series this morning on the end of your search for the perfect church. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 17 through 19. And so today we're going to set the stage. I'm preaching on the theme, the end of your search for the perfect church. And then for the next four weeks, we're going to deal with what do we look for in a church. What do we look for when we establish our roots? And how many know that God will call you to a church? I preached years ago from Ezekiel 37 on the valley of dry bones, and when it said bone came together with bone, I was going to deal with the subject of unity. I was just a young preacher, about 22 years old, and I was all revved up, and I'm going to preach on unity, bone coming together with bone. And God said, step into your office during the Sunday school hour. He said, I want to revamp your thoughts. Bone coming together speaks more than of unity. It speaks of attachment. And God said to me that day, he said, your lag does not belong on your wife's body. It would look weird, and it would give her a limp. And I believe you need to find the body you belong to and get involved because the body is not just to meet your needs, it's to help you meet the needs of the body. You don't just need to be a consumer, you need to be a contributor. See, people go to church thinking, what am I going to get out of it? You need to go with the attitude, what can I put into it? Because when you give, it's given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And I want to tell you, that's not just monetarily. That's in every aspect of your giving. You get what you invest in. You receive what you pour into. And I want to read verses 17 through 19 of Matthew chapter 16 this morning. The Bible said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Father, this morning I pray for divine enablement and unction and anointing from on high. I pray, God, that I would be able to declare and deliver and decree a word in due season. I pray, God, that it would be falling upon fertile soil on ripe, righteous ground. I pray, Lord, that the seed would produce fruit that remains. I pray, Lord, you'd answer somebody's questions, and Lord, you would point someone in the right direction. Those that are searching and seeking would find that you're all they need. And Lord, I pray today your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. For years, decades, centuries, and even millenniums, People have been searching for thriving, growing churches that meet all their needs and the needs of the needy but have no needs of their own. Let me say that again. For years, decades, centuries, and even millenniums, people have been searching for a thriving, growing church that meets all their needs and the needs of the needy yet has no needs of its own. 
Today, many of the largest churches in America and around the world seek to fulfill the desires of the people. Yet even in these mega churches, they have their critics and their discontents. How many understand that church splits are not merely a problem of modern society? And since COVID hit, let me tell you a little secret. It's not just Central Assembly, but every pastor I talk to has the same dilemma. People have not come back to church. They stay home and they watch live stream and there's nothing wrong if you can't make it to church to watch live stream. But the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because you cannot be a contributor if you're merely a consumer. God didn't call you to take in everything and give out nothing. How many know that a pond that takes in water but has no outlet for it stagnates and brings death and decay? The same is true with a Christian, amen? Church splits are not merely a problem of our modern society. Jesus himself experienced a couple of church splits in his ministry. In John 6 and verse 68, after having preached a message that his congregation didn't like, they all decided to leave his church. Then he turned to his church board and he asked if they too were going to leave. And Peter put it plainly. He said, where else can we go? We've been to every other church in the area. Oh, no, he might not have said it that way. But you alone have the words of eternal life. He faced another church split when one twelfth of his congregation left and tried to destroy him and the entire church when they left. Judas ran a smear campaign endeavoring to tear down what God would raise up. And yet Jesus said, I will build my church. Moses had division in the body right in the middle of a building program. He sent out 12 people to check out their future plans. They were going to check out the promised land, and when they came back, they all agreed it was a marvelous idea. It was a God-ordained thing, but 10 of them said it may be God-ordained, but we can't do it. It's too difficult of a task. So we're going to cause a little trouble and a little trial and we're going to give you a little grief. Noah, during his time, the worldwide church in his day numbered merely eight individuals. The church had fallen apart. Only eight were there. And for all these difficulties throughout history of the church, it's still alive. I said the church is still alive. We're going to talk to you just for a few minutes this morning about the perfect church. These are excuses people use for leaving churches. It's important you find the church you belong to. You need to find the body God wants you connected to. Get in that body and stick to it, stay committed to it, and don't run from here to there. God hates church hoppers. We're tired of chasing sheep from one pasture to another. It's time we birth some new baby lambs. I don't need to feed another shepherd's sheep. I need to feed the flock that God made me an overseer of. Let me say this. The first ingredient to finding the the perfect church is you have to have the perfect pastor. Just don't even go there. God and I have had a deal since I've been in the ministry 42 years. He gets the glory and I take the blame. If it's good, it's God, and if it's bad, it's me. Amen? To God be the glory. You see, everything comes from the head down, or does it? Polluted rivers can be clean upstream. 
I, I graduated from Warrensburg High School in the Adirondacks and the Hudson River flowed through the town. And how many know that the, the river got dirty downstream, down near the city it's polluted, but up there it's pure. My arm can be broken without any trauma to my head. The prodigal's father was not a bad dad because his son went astray. Let me give you the, the description of the perfect pastor. If you're taking notes and want to critique me, here it is. He's 29 years old with 40 years of experience. I'm only 26. I'm dyslectic. Just reverse the numbers. He has a PhD in counseling, theology, law, and finance. He spends 40 hours a week in prayer and study and sermon preparation, 30 hours every week counseling, 30 hours every week in administrative duties, 30 hours a week in visitation. He's a polished pulpiteer, a diplomatic negotiator, an astute administrator, a legal expert, a phenomenal financier, a professional plumber, a chauffeur, a mechanic, an incredible musician, and an innovative engineer. He keeps in shape, dresses nicely, gets proper rest, and has ample time for his family. In other words, he knows everything and can do it all for little pay and much criticism. Look at Moses. Was he the perfect leader? I think that Moses was the greatest leader of the Old Testament. He had a congregation that swelled to over two million people. He watched God part the Red Sea. He met God supernaturally at a burning bush. God gave Moses the Decalogue, handwritten in stone, the law of God given to Moses. But Moses wasn't perfect. He had a, a speech problem. He stuttered. He had a violent temper and he was criticized for being in an interracial marriage. Korah rose up against him with 250 of the leaders, told him he took too much on himself and started to cause trouble and there was a split there and it was the ground splitting open and swallowing Korah and his 250 followers. His brother and sister Aaron and Miriam said, Does God only use you? Begin to cause trouble in the flock. And Miriam came down with leprosy for a week or so. The people all begin to murmur and say, You brought us out in this wilderness to kill us. So even Moses had his problems. But God used Moses to do some incredible things. He was the deliverer of Israel out of the land of bondage. Look at Peter, one of the leaders of the early church. Here was a foul mouth, violent temper. Remember when he took off the guard's ear impulsively? You're not going to touch Jesus. I'll cut your ear off in a heart. We can't have people like that in the church, especially in the pulpit. He was weak in the faith. He jumped out of the boat at an impulse, but then he took his eyes off Jesus and sank into the sea. <clears throat> he had a fear of men. He denied Jesus. He had a disagreement with Brother Paul. They had an argument that they had to get through, and they had com com conflict between them over whether you were to be circumcised as a Gentile or not. Didn't get along with everybody, quick to fight, quick to pick fights, but God used Peter on the day of Pentecost, the church began to grow under his ministry. 3,000 added to the church the first day, 5,000 the next day, and God used Peter supernaturally throughout his life. Even Paul lacked people skills. He had a disagreement with Peter, had a problem with John Mark, got mad at him, and had to have a reconciliation later. He was a long-winded, boring preacher who put Eutychus to sleep and Eutychus fell asleep while Paul was preaching. He fell out the window and died. Paul raised him up and preached all night long. You think I'm long-winded. Put up with Paul for a day. 
He even dealt with some spiritual issues of his own. He said, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. I am not the perfect man, not that I've attained, not that I've arrived, not that I've achieved, but I do this, I forget what's behind, and I reach forth to what's before, and I press toward the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I may not be the perfect pastor, but I'm the man that God put in the position, he said. Look at Gideon, who God chose to defeat the Midianites. He suffered self-esteem issues. He had low self-esteem. I am the least of my father's house. My father's the least of the tribes. I'm a nobody going nowhere. I'm not a mighty man of valor. I'm a coward. I, I am just a weakling. I don't have it all together. As a matter of fact, I'm falling apart. I'm just hiding in the wine press, hoping nobody dials my number or calls me or, or FaceTimes me or Facebooks me or anything else. Leave me alone. But God said, I've got other plans for you, Gideon. And he was sifted from 32,000 in his congregation down to 300. And no giftings in any of them. They had no weapons. Think of Abraham, the father of our faith. He was a liar who lacked faith. Three times he doubted God. Twice he lied and said his wife was his sister because he was afraid of the king. And then one other time he didn't think God was coming through, so he slept with Hagar and produced Ishmael because he didn't think God was doing his part. He lacked faith. He was a liar. He was a trouble man. He had division between his herdsmen and his nephew Lot's herdsmen. There was a, a split in the congregation there, and so they had to go down to Sodom and leave Abraham behind. Think of Jacob, the father of the twelve. He was a deceiver. There was discord between him and his brother, division with his uncle Laban, his, who also was his father-in-law, this guy had trouble because he was a liar and a cheater, and yet God used him mightily. So if you're looking for the perfect pastor, don't. If you're looking for the perfect church, you won't find it. Well, let's move ahead and uh, let's understand that God chooses 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Look at the early church of Corinth where they begin to argue over I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I have my favorite pastor. And God's saying, I don't take the eloquent, I don't take the educated, I take what you wouldn't take, and that's who I use because God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. We not only have to have a perfect pastor, but how many know we need to have perfect parishioners? Oh, you know, I used to say on the road when I was an evangelist, I'd say, the first night they're all checking you out. Is this guy a good preacher? What kind of anointing does he have? Can he read my mail like the last guy we had? Does he, uh, is he gifted in signs and wonders and miracles more than the last guy? We got to check him out. And I used to say to him right on the very first night, you came to check me out, but I'm checking you out. Somebody once said the pastor is God's gift to a congregation, but also the congregation is God's gift to the pastor. Amen. And I believe it's like a marriage and God puts you together because you sharpen each other. And iron sharpens iron. That means we're going to rub each other the wrong way from time to time, but we're not going to do it to be destructive but beneficial. 
And when you're looking for the perfect church, you must consider the congregation. Who's going to be sitting in the pew next to you? It's of utmost importance that you don't expose yourself to the wrong influence or are seen with the wrong people. We, ha we must not allow ourselves to be associated with a bunch of hypocrites. We may have some of our own issues, but they're not nearly as bad as the issues of others. I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as you. When Jesus began his ministry on earth, he put a team together. And knowing the magnitude of his task, he'd have to have the right people in place. And so here's the crew he chose. Peter, the opinionated one. Nobody else's opinion mattered, only his. And he was quick to let you know what it was. Others may fail you, but I'll never let you down. James and John were mama's boys, position seekers. One wanted to sit on the right and the other on the left. John was a brown noser. He was always leaning on Christ's breast. He's always looking for position. Thomas was full of doubt. He was a skeptic, and he couldn't support the church's vision unless he could see it in black and white. All of them fell apart in in the time of testing, remember in the boat when the storm came up, they all freaked out. Whoa, you don't care that we die? Bunch of wimps. Judas was always criticizing the way the funds were being spent, and the love of money became his downfall. Christ's congregation consisted of unhealthy, undesirable, untouchable, unsanctified, unwanted people, and these people had issues. They had baggage. It got a little quiet between the perfect pastor and the perfect parishioner. Can you imagine sitting next to the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery who didn't dress like a Christian? Can you imagine if she slid into the seat beside your husband, lady? Can you imagine worshiping with the hypocritical Pharisee Simon whose house Jesus went and there was the greatest act of worship ever demonstrated when a woman broke an alabaster box in his house to worship God. Can you imagine shaking hands with the unclean leper? Can you imagine fellowshipping with that no good tax collector Zacchaeus? Can you imagine having to deal with that pushy, needy woman with the issue of blood who didn't care who she pushed aside or ran over to get what she needed? Not to mention those noisy nuisance kids and teens who wanted to steal all the attention. Yet with all these contentious, critical, undesirable, unhealthy people, Jesus said, I will build my church. John 8, 7, Jesus said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. How many understand that we need to be a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints? The next thing we need to have the perfect church is not only the perfect pastor and the perfect parishioners, we need the perfect facilities. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, We house this treasure in earthen vessels. The excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You can't have a perfect church without a perfect building. After all, who wants to go to church where the air conditioning is either too cold or not working? Who wants to go to church where there's not padded seats? Go to Haiti or go to Africa and see what their pews are like. And who wants to travel more than 15 minutes to an out-of-the-way place? You know what I was told one time? That good restaurants draw crowds from miles around because the food's good, not because it's a long drive. You'll drive a long way for a good meal. 
but you won't cross the street to go to church. And we even have van ministry, and you don't have to drive. Ouch. Let's look at some of the facilities Jesus ministered in when he was on this earth. He, he ministered to a crowd of thousands in a place without pews and no coffee bars or snack bars nearby. He didn't have the Missions Cafe serving a delicious breakfast and good coffee in the morning. On another occasion, he stood in a boat in the middle of a torrential downpour, incredible wind gust, an unstable platform that was tossed about by the waves, and there was no restroom facilities at that meeting house. No carpet on the floor at the tomb of Gadara. On other occasions, he'd attend services at the temple I remember when I was in Hawaii, the Samoans would sit under thatched roofs suspended by poles and the wind would come and blow those banana leaf roofs apart. In Haiti, if they had chairs, they were old wooden benches with no back support in a hundred degree heat. And yet we complain about our facilities now and we have the latest and greatest. Can't go to church, my back hurts. We could get you some hospital beds maybe and lay them out in the back. You could rest a little more. But these chairs aren't too bad. You know what the Bible said? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it said, Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter what the facilities are. When I was a boy growing up, I remember in Norwich, my dad pastored the church. He built a new church before we left, but we had a church that was built 40 years before and it was meant to be torn down the same year. It was supposed to be a temporary structure. It was still up 40 years later. It was old, the old theater seats, you know, the leather-covered ones that would have springs popping through. And, and it, oh, it was crazy. But it used to be we'd meet in the storefronts. I remember camp meeting when it was no concrete at all. They had just mud and when it rained, you would be sitting in, in benches that were in the mud hole. They had sawdust up at the altar, so you didn't worry about getting your suit pants dirty. They were going to get dirty, but your heart would get clean. We used to meet in storefronts. Didn't care about air conditioning. How, how many of you that have been around this thing a long time remember the old hand fans? Camp meeting was filled with the old hand fans, and it was whipping a whole lot of garbage around. Who knows what kind of germs were being sent through that place, amen? But we had Pentecost back then. We had church back then. We had a move of God back then. Sinners would come in and get saved. They'd repent of their sin and get right with God. And it didn't matter who was sitting next to them. It didn't matter what kind of bum had come in off the street. It didn't matter who had come in uh, out of the jailhouse or out of the church house. It didn't matter. They all came together for the same reason, to get a hold of God. If we'd come to church to give a little more, we'd get a lot more. You'd get a whole lot more out of service if you put a lot more into it. Sometimes standing up here to preach, I, I just, I say, help me, Jesus. I don't know who's awake. I don't know who's asleep. I don't know who's mad. I don't know who's fighting with their spouse because I get looks like blank stares. It's all right to shout hallelujah once in a while. You can shout amen or shout ouch. Either way, I know you're alive. In spite of all this, he said, I will build my church. Now we're going to deal with the last thing that has to be perfect in order to have the perfect church. And what I'm going to do in the next four weeks is I'm going to go through each one of these and we're going to dissect it and we're going to talk about it. The last area we want to deal with that has to be perfect is we have to have a perfect worship service. Now I'm meddling. That worship service wasn't 
upbeat enough for me. It wasn't fast enough. It didn't have the right beat so I could shake my booty. I'd rather get in the presence of God than just get my emotions stirred. One thing that we endeavor to have in this church is a move of God and we covet the presence of God and we want to come into the worship, not just the praise. Praise, I, I, I can't be preaching this because I'm going to preach it in four weeks. I, I'm going to preach about the perfect worship service. But today, if you want to build a perfect church, you have to have a perfect worship service. It's imperative, imperative to have professional musicians can I tell you, professional musicians often don't rely on the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They rely on the human talent and you miss God. I told Pastor Brennan, I told John Santulli before when he was alive and leading worship, I've told every worship leader we've had, I don't want a worship leader. Cheryl knows I've said that. She's been on all of the teams. I want a worshiper. If I have to wor lead you into worship, then I am a cheerleader and your heart's not in it. You're going through the motions. But if I'm just worshiping, others are going to follow suit. If I'm just lost in the presence of God, you're going to get there too. It doesn't need to be a professional performance. Today we're relying on our professionalism and our productions, but we're not relying on the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost anointing to come in where people begin to snot down their face and tear down their face and have to wipe the tears and snot together off their face because the anointing is rich and real and they can't stop the flow of the Holy Ghost. That's the kind of worship service I'm used to. That's the kind of worship service I want where I'm not trying to impress people. I'm trying to please God where he tears me up, rips me open, and puts me back together the right way. We don't need professional performers. We need broken lives. You know how hard it is to praise God if the music's too loud or too soft? I would try to praise God, but I, I, I was distracted by others. Come and sit up front and you won't be. Can I tell you what? I don't even know what's going on in worship service other than I'm worshiping him. I don't have to worship him the way you do, and you don't have to worship him the way I do. You, you know, I don't care if you whistle. That's your heart. I don't care if you stand quiet or sit in your seat. That's your way to worship as long as you're getting into the presence of God, as long as you're bringing honor and glory to Jesus Christ. We are different individuals. We respond differently. The truth is we all have to respond somehow. Don't try to do it the way you think it ought to be done. Do it the way it will please God. If people can't relate to music, they can't touch God. Shame on them. Paul and Silas brought their own band in a prison house. Wasn't even in the church house. After all, if you don't provide quality worship, the church up the street will, and a good worship team will attract the crowd. Again, I'm not looking for a worship team. I'm looking for a worshiper. Because... I want to get into the holy of holies. The Bible said that anybody can praise God. You don't have to be saved to praise God. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You don't even have to be human to praise God. The heavens declare the glory of God, but he seeks for those that will worship him. Worshippers are hard to come by because worship flows from the heart. Again, you'll hear this in about four weeks, but praise lifts you, worship lowers you. You praise him for what he's done, you worship him for who he is. Amen? A lot of people are glad for what he does for them, but they don't know who he is. 
Let me tell you, Moses didn't know just what God could do. He knew who God was. God made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. People want to get excited about what God does, but they don't know who he is. God's looking for worshipers, and we need the perfect worship service. Paul and Silas didn't have instruments, and they were so loud they woke up all the others that were sleeping around them. They didn't have backup singers. They didn't have professional performers, but they still managed to see the power of God fall even when the environment wasn't conducive to a quality worship experience. And in spite of all this, true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. And even when the worship team may miss a note now and then and they may not be perfect in their performance, God said, I'm pleased with that and I inhabit the praise of my people. So if you're looking for the perfect church, don't go. Because it was probably perfect till we came. People say, I don't go to church, it's full of hypocrites. My dad said there's room for one more. But are you looking for the perfect church? Because although people haven't come back totally from COVID to the church, Jesus didn't say, I'm building my live stream. I love you folks, and if you can't come, I understand that. But he said, I'll build my church. Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Because church isn't just for what you get out of it. Church is for what you put into it. Churches, we are one body with many members, and every joint supplies. You say, but I don't have any giftings. Yes, you do. You just haven't developed them yet. You can't see my skin. If I peel my skin off, it's opaque, almost transparent, it's translucent. But take your skin off and see how long you live. Just your presence makes a difference. Consistent presence. Constant presence. Uplifting. Maybe just a word of encouragement to somebody sitting by you makes a difference for them for that day. You are needed, and when you're absent, you're missed. But it's not the perfect church. Well, we're going we're gonna to dissect it. Next week, I'm going to, for the next two weeks, I'm going to preach on the perfect pastor. I'm going to talk next week on the requirements for a perfect pastor. Then I'm going to talk about the responsibility for the perfect pastor. Then we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the perfect congregation and what is required from you to make the church better. And our fourth Sunday after today, we're going to talk about the perfect worship service and how to better the worship service. There's no perfect church. It depends on how you view it. it. Depends on how you see it. And you know how you're going to see it? By what you're looking at. And when you're looking at Jesus, you're not going to see the imperfections of humanity. Oh, you may notice the few things that aren't perfect, but your focus is going to be on the one who is. If you're looking for the perfect church, join with the saints who are imperfect and worship the perfect God. And then you'll have the perfect church. <laughs> Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are building your church. And we're going to discuss what your word says about what is necessary in the choice of the church we attend. And God, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us insights and understanding, and Lord, you would speak to us from your word, not from our opinion, but give us the scripture and the Bible to be our guide. And Lord, I pray if there's somebody struggling with church attendance, 
because they have not found the church to be a perfect place with perfect people. May they start changing their perspective and looking for a perfect God. And Lord, I pray, God, you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against your church. I'd like every head up and every eye open and please look my way for a minute. That years ago I saw a sign, and you probably saw it too, on a church billboard. It said CH blank blank CH. It said, What is missing? You are. How many know that you are the church? The word church means ecclesia, the called out ones. The church of Jesus Christ is the body of born-again believers that have accepted Christ and are living for him. It's more than just praying a prayer. It's more than just saying words. It's letting Christ in and you live for him and serve him. You let him take you from glory to glory. To be a part of the church, you can sit in the pew and not be part of the church. You can be part of a church, but not his church. To be a part of his church, you must be born again into the family. And if you're here today and you've never asked Christ into your heart, or if you're viewing live stream and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you're not part of the church. You say, well, I don't want to be part of a church. Well, you need to be a part of his church. Because if you're not part of his church, if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. You need to ask Christ into your heart to forgive you, and you need to let him do that. You need to let him live in you. And if you are not part of the church of Jesus Christ, I didn't say Central Assembly. I didn't say any other church name, but if you're not a part of the church of Jesus Christ, heaven's not going to be your home when eternity calls your name. In order to go to heaven, your name must be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It needs to be signed on the registry of the church of Jesus Christ. You need to be a member of his church. We are members one of another, one body, one family. I want to ask you a question today. Have you asked Christ into your heart? Are you part of the family of God? Are you part of the church of Jesus Christ? Is he the Lord of your life? Have you asked him to come in and are you living for him? The words don't mean anything unless you mean them in your heart and when you pray them, you apply them. God, I live according to your word now. I live according to your will, not my will. He's going to say to some that think because they've done a lot of works, oh Lord, we've cast out devils, we've prophesied in your name, we've done miracles. And he's going to say, I never knew you, depart from me. It's not your religion, it's your relationship. It's not the works you've accomplished, it's the life you've lived. Have you submitted your life to Jesus Christ? That's when you become a part of the church of Jesus Christ. If you have never asked Christ into your heart and you want to be part of the church of God, church of Jesus I'm going to ask you to do this stand right where you're at come to this altar and meet me here and I'll pray with you you're not joining this church you're not pleasing this preacher you're saying I want to be a part of his church I want to be part of the ecclesia the called out ones those that are separated for him and by him if you want to ask Christ in your heart just come nobody's going to be a in, uh, mocking you stand right there and I'm going to come right over and meet you here and I'm going to pray with you are there others that you want to come and make Jesus Lord of your life amen this is precious we've already had one accept Christ before service started so you see this is what church is about right here Seeing people go from hell to heaven. Seeing Christ come into their life and making old things new. Your old life is going to be gone. 
As soon as you pray this prayer with me, Jesus is washing your sin away. And should he come right now, as soon as we pray this prayer and you say, Lord, come into my life, you go to heaven if you die. Amen. I want you to pray with me out loud. And via live stream, pray it out loud with us in the auditorium. Pray it out loud. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now with all of my hurts and my heartaches, with all of my faults and my failures, with all of my sins and shortcomings. I ask you, Jesus, to take me right now just the way I am. Make me, dear Lord, what you want me to be and only your grace can cause me to be. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and my life. Be my Savior and my Lord. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. Amen. 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 Not upset, just happy. Can't help it, no matter how many times I've seen somebody come to Christ, it never gets old. If every week somebody came and gave their life to Christ, it wouldn't get old. Thank God. There's new names written in glory. Somebody just went from hell to heaven. I don't know how, how that makes you feel, but that makes me feel good. That tells me the church is doing its job. Because we're here to point souls to him, not to draw them to us. Hopefully when they come to him, they'll come here because they can grow properly in God. And I believe in feeding the flock. We're going to talk about that in the days and weeks ahead. Why do we choose the church we choose? We're going to talk about that. What do we look for when we're looking for one? Because how many know not just any church will do? Not just any church is good enough. If it doesn't preach and live Jesus Christ, if it doesn't preach and live the Word of God, it's not church. It's a social club. His church will preach Him and live Him and promote Him and produce Him. It won't just tickle your ears because in the last days they'll heap to themselves teachers have itching ears. Say what you want to hear but not care where you spend eternity. I want to tell you, I would rather hurt your feelings and spare your soul than spare your soul and appease your emotion. Let's stand this morning as we close in prayer. Father, let us be the church the true church of Jesus Christ by winning souls to Christ by seeing the lost found and the searching satisfied and Lord may we go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that your house may be full this is not our house if it becomes our house it stops being your house I pray when people come in the doors of this facility, they would find themselves in the presence of God, not in the professional production of a man. I pray, God, that everything said and done would bring glory and honor to Jesus. And, Lord, I pray it would point people to Christ. And, Lord, I ask this in your holy name and for your glory alone. Go with us as we go to our houses and our homes. Protect us, preserve us, and keep us. Bring us back again next Sunday again, ready to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before you go, this altar remains open. If you need a touch of God physically, spiritually, emotionally, we'll be here at the altar praying for people. So.
you're free to go, but go quietly. And if you need to be here at the altar, come and receive a touch from God.